that does not mean that he was disobedient and had to learn obedience. That's not it at all. But what that really means is simply this, that in his humanity, in his humanity, he was both deity and humanity, in his humanity, he learned, listen, he learned the impact of full obedience to the Father at the cross. In other words, he knew all about everything. But when it came to this issue of obedience unto death, and that's what that's referring to. It's not referring to the fact that he'd sinned, he's disobedient, now he had to learn how to be obedient. He was always obedient. So when you and I think about obedience, how would you define it? Obedience is real simple. Obedience says, and if you'll think about your own children, obedience says, I do what God says, when he says it, how he says it, for whatever reason he says it, or with whom he says it. In other words, it's all about him. There is not anything passive about being obedient. It's active. It's a decision that you and I make whether we will obey God or not in whatever the situation may be. Now, what is the greatest enemy to obedience? Partial obedience is the greatest enemy to obedience because if I say, well, God told me, let's for, for example, God told me to give a tithe, and, and so I gave at least 5%. Well, you say, well, isn't that obedience? Obedience is doing what he says, when he says, why he says, how he says, where he says, or whatever it might be. It is impartial. And I think a lot of people live out their lives, watch this, and they trust Jesus as their Savior. And a lot of times it's because nobody taught them. And so they do some things that they believe that are right and uh, good. And then there's some things they know that that really doesn't fit who they are as followers of Jesus Christ. And so you ask them, are you a Christian? Yes. Uh, are you an obedient Christian? Yes. And they can name you all the things that they do partially or sort of or sometimes. But obedience says, I do what he says, when he says, for whatever he reason he says, where he says, or with whom if someone else is involved. But I see so many Christians who really believe that they're walking in the Spirit of God, who are allowing things in their life that absolutely are not, are not of God, could not possibly be of God, and they rationalize it. And rationalization is Satan's, listen, that's Satan's attempt to keep you off base in your relationship to Him. If I want God's best in my life, I must be obedient to Him. And if you'll think about how wise that is, God who is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, uh, knowing all things, loves us absolutely perfectly, and He's given us a course to live, you can't improve on His course. In other words, he's got, He has the best plan for every single one of us. He has the best answer for every question we ask. He, listen, He has the best of everything if we'll follow Him. And how do we follow Him? We obey Him or we don't obey Him. And I'm going to ask you a question. Are you happier when you know that you're obeying God? Are you happier when you know that you're being disobedient? I wouldn't insult you to have you raise your hand. Everybody knows the answer to that. <laughs> then why don't we obey Him? If you'll think about the reasons people don't obey God, well, I, I, I may miss something. Are you going to miss something that God who loves you has planned your life? There may be some things in life you need to miss. And there's some things in life you need to be there when it happens. And when you're walking in His will, you'll be there. You will not, listen, you will not miss when you walk in the will of God and be obedient to Him. Now, so with all that in mind, let's think about how do we learn to obey God? You didn't come into the world with knowing how. So I just want to give you some things to consider in your own life because nobody knows your life like you do. But you need to learn how to be obedient to God. And the first one is simply this. You must first choose to trust Him. If you don't trust Him, you're not going to obey Him. Because one of the primary reasons we don't obey God is we don't believe what He says. When God says, I will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus, when He says that, and I go out and do something that is ridiculous and something that is dishonest in order to get something that I want, I desire, what I've said is, I don't believe God. So ask yourself the question, where is your trust level? When it comes to your relationship to Him and living obedient and performing, the next time you're tempted to be disobedient, ask yourself the question, watch this carefully, what is it 
I'm not trusting. How is it? What is it I'm not trusting God about in this situation? Because if I disobey him, I'm not trusting him. So the second thing is this. We must determine to be willing to wait upon God in prayer. Many times God will tell us to do something and make it very clear. But he doesn't say, do it now. And sometimes he doesn't say when he's going to do it. But he just says, here's what I want you to do. And, uh, well, Lord, now when? And sometimes you and I may pray about something for a long time before we get the go signal. And you say, well, well, what's that about? Here's what it's about. It's about God loving you enough and knowing you perfectly to know when you are ready for whatever it is you're seeking. And sometimes what you're looking for, what you're seeking, is not, it's not anything disobedient. It may be absolutely right down the center of the will of God, but His timing is important. And so if I'm going to be obedient, I must be willing to wait when I don't understand why I should wait, when I can't figure out what God is up to, when I think I've waited long enough. And this is what gets people in trouble. Well, you know, it's been four weeks gone by now, and I haven't heard a thing, so this is what I'm going to do. Is that obedience? No. That's you taking it out of God's hands, placing it in your hands, making a decisions, and failing to trust Him because you're failing to wait for His timing on whatever may be going on in your life. And so I think about that, and I think about oh, what, what's required of me to wait? Two things, patience and faith. If I'm in, listen, if, I, if, if we're impatient with somebody else, we can understand that. If you're impatient, think about this. If you're impatient with God, when you think about the impatient with God, I mean the one who knows all, who has the best plan for you, and I'm impatient with Him, I, I, don't, want, I don't want to wait for His timing, then we'll find ourselves in trouble because God's timing is perfect. So if I'm going to learn to, really and truly be obedient, I've got to learn to wait upon Him. Another thing is simply this, and that is, I must learn to meditate upon His Word every day. You will not live an obedient life with a closed Bible. Mark that down. Did you hear that? Four or five of you did. did listen, did you hear, you will not live an obedient life with a closed Bible. Amen? Amen. So, ask yourself the question, well, why, why do I need the Word of God? Because this is where the primary way God leads us. And sometimes you won't understand what God's up to in your life, but I just gave you an example. You may just say, Lord, I don't know what to do with this situation. I'm, I'm getting anxious, or Lord, I'll have to admit I'm getting a little impatient. Speak to my heart. Here's where you go. Because, listen, you, you think about how thick this is, and how many, how many things God has said in His Word? Somewhere in here, I'm going to find an answer. Listen, you will not live a godly life without an open Bible. And I, I, one of my favorite passages is in Joshua chapter 1. I love this, be, and, and this has been one of my favorites for years. Listen to what he said. He said to Joshua, Have I not commanded you to be strong and of a good courage? He said, Don't tremble or be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous. And listen to what he says in verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You don't read it once a week. But you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful, listen, be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous, then you'll be successful. How many of you believe the whole Bible? Amen? Amen. You believe all of it's true? Yes. You believe that passage is true? Yes. He says He will bless you in all that you do. But He says you've got, you've got to be in the Word. The Word of God the Word of God is His, He says it's a light to our path. And so, He's given us His Word to give us guidance and direction. Then, of course, we must walk when the way is not clear. Look, if you will, in Hebrews uh, chapter 11. 
We must be willing to walk when the way is not clear. Somebody says, well, I'm, yeah, here's my feeling. I'm, God's got to show it to me. You've got to write it in the sky. God's not in the business of writing it in the sky. Look, if you will, in this 11th chapter of, of uh, Hebrews about Abraham. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. You say, what's that got to do with me? Simply this. I've lived long enough to know that many times, if you're going to be obedient to God, you've got to, you've got to head out, and you will not know exactly what's going to happen. I think about uh, where, for example, we are in touch today, and because of God, number one, and so many of you who have prayed and given and so forth. We started that with a 30-minute program in Atlanta at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. We had two little, two little orange boxes that we call TV cameras. And today, you can hear it all over the world or see it all over the world. If somebody says, <laughs> now if somebody says, how did you plan it? I had nothing to do with it. I say that sincerely. Never planned it, never programmed it, never said, here's what we're going to do, here's how we're going to get there. And this is why what I want you to say is this. You cannot, you absolutely cannot foresee and foretell what God is going to do in your life until you obey Him. Suppose we just said, we're not going to do that till we get some expensive stuff. We're not going to do that till uh, uh, we, we have certain things that we don't have and so forth. No. If God tells you to take a baby step, you take it. And if, and if you don't know where you're going next, listen, all you have to do is to obey God today. What He tells you to do today, He already has tomorrow perfectly in mind. Perfectly in mind. So the reason we get in trouble is because if we can't see our... Watch this carefully. You listen and say amen. amen. If we can't see our way clearly, we imply that God can't. He says, my word is a lamp to your feet, light to your path. God sees the second step and the third, the fourth, the fifth. He sees all of this. All we have to do is to be obedient to Him. And I can say to you, wisdom says, wisdom says it's always best to obey God, even if it's a tiny step or if it's a major leap. You can't lose either way because He is the one who is giving the guidance and the direction. He's the one who has the goals in mind. Another thing is this, I must be willing to experience conflict. If I'm going to obey God, there's going to be conflict. Every pastor in the world can tell you, can tell you that. But you know what? Everybody who lives a God in life is going to have something. It can be conflict in your family, uh, with your children, your husband, or your wife. And uh, uh, there's going to be conflict, conflict in the way we reason things. For example, when God told Noah to build an ark, it was t absolutely, totally ridiculous. When he told Joshua to march around Jericho and watch it fall down, none of that fit. Anything human reason had to do with it. You go through the Scriptures and see how God challenged His servants to do one thing after the other. And oftentimes, uh, it created conflict in their minds and their hearts because they wondered, how am I going to do this? And this is why we come to the next thing. You must be willing to leave the consequences to Him. If you wait till you can figure out the consequences, you will not obey God. And every single day, think about this, you and I have the privilege of growing just a little bit more. Every time we are challenged and we obey Him, we grow. Every time we obey Him and we watch Him work in our life, we grow. This is why I say, one of my mottos, obey God and watch Him work. Because if you watch Him work, you're going to see Him work out His will in your life in a way that will surprise you. Then, of course, I must be willing to accept the divine chastisement in response to my disobedience. If, for example, you disobey God, and God brings down His hand of chastisement, and you fight against it, and you rebel against it, and you refuse, and you blame God, what, what does it say? It says simply this, I don't trust him. I don't believe what he said. I don't like how he responded. 
when the truth is we've disobeyed him. All of it, no, nobody likes chastisement from God. And he says it's an act of love on his part for us. When you and I are really, when we really have an obedient spirit, and we do something that brings down God's chastising hand, I'll know that I'm obedient to him when I say, thank you, God, for not letting me go the wrong way. Thank you for not letting me make that decision. Thank you for, for not letting me have that. Thank you for showing me a different way. In other words, if, I'm, if I have an obedient spirit, I'll thank him even when I'm chastised. But if I rebel against it, blame him, ask him why, when the truth is we know why, then somehow I've not learned to be obedient to him. Now, when I think about all of those things and think about what old rebellion is all about and all of God's servants had to get chastised at some point, we all do, and that's good for us. It's protection on God's part in our behalf. When you think about your life, what is it that you're facing, that you're dealing with, that would keep you from saying this morning, Father, I want your will in this situation no matter what. And I choose to say today, I will be obedient to you in this, and I will leave the consequences to you. Is there anything in your life that would keep you from saying that? And if it is, ask yourself this question. Well, if I don't trust him, who am I going to trust? If I don't obey him, what am I going to do? You cannot lose obeying God. And if I could say one thing in my dying moment, this is what I'd say. Obey God. Leave all the consequences to him. You cannot lose. You cannot lose. Now, everybody in here has heard this. But the question is, how many of you will walk out and obey that principle? And my prayer is that every single person in here will. There's only one way, and that's God's way. I might ask you one last question. What consequence in your life is it that God can't handle? Not a one. Amen? Well, let me just say this to you. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then listen carefully. I'm not being condemning at all. I'm just simply saying if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, then you're living a life that's rebelling against God. What you're saying is you think you can do it better than He can. What you're saying is you don't trust what He said about heaven and hell, judgment. So you're going to live it your way. And I simply want to say to you, you're not going to win that game. You will die disappointed, full of regrets, and full of pain in your heart, if not in your body. The wisest thing you can do is to obey God. And what does he say? Today is the day of salvation. Call upon the name of the Lord. If you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and that he's raised from the dead. He's a living Christ. That his death at Calvary paid your sin debt in full, and if you're willing to ask him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you, he will save you this morning right now. That's the testimony, the witness of the Word of God, the eternal Word of God. And if you do not trust him as your Savior, what you have to ask is this, what are the consequences? You don't even want to hear them. I plead with you in Jesus' name to make the wisest decision you could ever make, to make Jesus Christ the Savior and Lord of your life and choose to live with this principle. I will obey God in every aspect of my life, and I'll leave all the consequences to Him. And Father, how grateful we are. We know that to be true. We never have to wonder whether it's true or not. And I pray that anybody seated here today who is unsaved today, they will determine to be obedient to you by trusting you as their Savior. I pray that for those decisions that are being made by people all over this place this morning, that they'll make that decision. God, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to watch you work. I'm going to leave all the consequences to you. And I'm going to trust you 
to prove yourself to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Coming up in just a moment, more with Dr. Charles Stanley. God's a good God. He's a God of opportunities. He, he wants to see us, listen, interested in life. He wants to see us exciting about life. When people who call themselves Christians are bored with life and are sort of dissatisfied living in a rut, there's something wrong with your vision. Around you, in front of you, there are opportunities to do things, that, listen, that would turn your life inside out, upside down, and right side up. Today on In Touch, when opportunities appear. We are continually being confronted with all kinds of opportunities, and yet a lot of folks just walk right through life and miss most of them for the simple reason they're not looking, they're not expecting. They sort of see themselves as sort of outside the realm of the blessings of God, and maybe once in a while they'll sense a little bit. That's not the way life is, because you see, God gives us opportunities to guide us and to lead us. He also makes their life very interesting and exciting as a result of opportunities because nobody likes sameness. Sameness creates a dullness. And uh, when we have opportunities that challenge us, they oftentimes stretch us, we begin to be excited about things in life that we didn't even know existed. And of all the people who ought to be sensitive to opportunities, God's children should be. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, giving us direction. He's the one who gives us a spiritual eye to see these things that other people do not see. And when you think about the fact that you and I have trusted Christ as our Savior, He is our very life. We're going to heaven when we die, 
But he has an exciting life down here before he takes us home because we have the privilege of walking with him, living with him, listening to him, absorbing him, understanding him, getting a glimpse of what God is really all about. You say, well, you know, now I've been a Christian a pretty good while, but I never thought about having all these opportunities. Well, you do. And what I want to do in this message is give you a series of opportunities from the Scripture that will give you an idea that maybe you're missing some opportunities in your life. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, so far you have missed the most important opportunity you will ever have. And I trust that before this time is over, you'll make a decision. You'll take advantage of the opportunity of trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Well, I want you to turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 5. And Paul in this chapter has been talking about the Christian life and how to live a godly life. And he talks about walking in love. And uh, the life that we used to live is a life of walking in darkness. And that we're not to participate in the life of darkness any longer. So he comes down to this 15th, 16th, 17th verses that I want to mention a couple of things about. He says in verse 15, Therefore, be careful how you walk. And when he uses the term walk, uh, it's a term which simply means to walk about. That is, it's a way of life for you. He says, be careful how you live out your life. Not as unwise men and women, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now, when he says making the most of your time, there are two Greek words in the Scripture for time. One of them is chronos, which is like your, your watch, and uh, there are watches that uh, have some of that name in them. And then kairos, which is simply a matter of an opportunity. Make the most of your opportunities, what he's saying, which of course is your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, I want to say something I'm going to say probably after every point in this message. And that is, we are to, listen, we are to be careful how we walk. We are to be wise about our decisions, and we are to be alert to opportunities. We are to be wise about how we make decisions. We are to be alert to our opportunities. Because many people live in the midst of opportunities every day and never somehow are able to recognize them. They think of opportunities as making lots of money or having a new house or going here and going there. There are opportunities in life that are far more important than those. And if you miss them, you're going to miss some of the most exciting times in your life. And if your life is boring and you sort of settle down into a rut, it's because your eyes are closed, because you're not being able to see what God has right before you. And I trust that in this passage and these passages, you'll begin to see some opportunities that maybe you've been overlooking. And once you begin to get engaged and seize these opportunities, your life is going to be exciting. And I want to turn to uh, all of these passages are familiar on purpose. I try to choose the ones that I think most people would be uh, conscious of. And so I want to begin with the first one in uh, John chapter 6, if you'll turn there. John chapter 6, and um, it's a passage that most people are familiar with, and it just so happens this is the only, this is the only miracle that Jesus performed that's found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so if you'll notice uh, beginning in this, uh, in this first verse, Scripture says, after these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the sea of Galilee to Tiberias, trying to get away from the crowd. So a little bit, a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountains and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was near. Therefore, Jesus lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. So Philip answered him and said, To 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. 
Now there was much grass in the place, and so the men sat down in the number which was about 5,000. So if you add all the ladies to that, it had a big crowd. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is true of the prophet who, is a, who has come into the world. They said, well, What's that got to do with opportunities? Well, let's think about it for a moment. When that little boy left home that morning, the only thing he knew is he was going to find Jesus, and he wanted to be in the crowd. He wanted to hear what he had to say. And so little did he realize that on this day, he would experience the greatest opportunity of his lifetime. But he didn't know that. And so when Jesus asked for his bread and his fish, and he gave it to him, and he began to multiply it, he saw a miracle take place right before his eyes. Think about this. He had the opportunity to give Jesus something that Jesus could use. He had the opportunity of watching a miracle take place. He had the opportunity of watching all these people fed because of his little five loaves and his, his two fish. Can you imagine that he ran all the way home to tell his mother? He must have ran as fast as he possibly could. You will not believe what I saw. Now, that's a simple opportunity, but look what happened. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about the little boy who had five loaves and two fish. Why? Because he took advantage of an opportunity. He could have kept the five loaves and two fish for himself. He could have. But he said, no, I'm willing to give them up. Now, he didn't expect it, he didn't plan it, and he didn't anticipate it. And this is why I come back to that verse in Ephesians, that we are to walk in such a way that we walk a godly life, and that we are to be wise about our decisions, and we are to be, listen, alert to opportunities. And when we are, what we'll do, we'll begin to see opportunities around us that we've never seen before. We never even thought about it before. He never thought about that. He couldn't have planned that. And more than likely, you walk right by opportunities every day. You don't plan. Uh, you couldn't. You wouldn't know it. But there it is staring you in the face, the opportunity to do one of a number of things. What I want you to see in these passages is this. God wants us to learn to be alert to His opportunities because one of the ways He guides us and leads us in our life is He guides us and leads us by opportunities. He gives us an opportunity to go here. We go there. We hear something that changes our life. Or we may see something that we think, well, one of these days, maybe I could possibly enjoy something like that. And God begins to open the door. You see, He creates desires within our heart. Does He not say that if we delight ourselves in Him, that He will give us the desires of our heart? God's a good God. He's a God of opportunities. He, he wants to see us, listen, interested in life. He wants to see us exciting about life. When people who call themselves Christians are bored with life and are sort of dissatisfied living in a rut, there's something wrong with your vision. Around you, in front of you, there are opportunities to do things. That, listen, they would turn your life inside out, upside down, and right side up, because that's who he is. Uh, listen, a bored Christian is a bad testimony. An exciting Christian is a, is, is a powerful testimony. There are opportunities all around you if you stop and open your eyes and think and become alert. Alert to what God wants to do in your life and maybe what God wants to do in somebody else's life. All right, let's look at something else here. Because I just want you to see all the different kinds of opportunities that, that uh, God may send your way. Now, here's one. Listen carefully. I want you to listen very carefully because you're going to think, well, what's that? Every woman in here will identify with this. Look in Luke chapter 10, for example, and I want you to uh, uh, look at uh, just a few verses in this passage, in this 38th verse of this 10th chapter of Luke. 
Scripture says, And as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She was the elder one of the two. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and so she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Can you identify with that? Some of you can. The others can, but you won't admit it. <laughs> then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, when Jesus showed up, Mary immediately saw this awesome opportunity to get to know him better, to learn what he's really like on a one-to-one -one basis, where just the two of you are talking. Wouldn't you have loved to sit down with Jesus, just you and him, and just talk and listen to him? In fact, not much talking, but a whole lot of listening, and feel his compassion and his love. Let me talk to you about an opportunity you have. Every single one of us has the same opportunity every day. When you get up in the morning, you have a copy of the Word of God. You can open this book and you can read some of the things that Jesus said. You can see how he responded. You can see how he treated people. You can see how he forgave. You can see those whom he criticized. In other words, you can learn an enormous amount sitting in the presence of Jesus Christ by yourself, if necessary, with an open word of God. Listen, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, four Gospels that tell us everything that God knew we needed to know about what Jesus said, how he responded in situations and circumstances. Every single one of us has that opportunity. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you taking advantage of that opportunity? Do you start your day with the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word? Do you begin the day reading His Word and asking Him to give you direction for the day and to give you guidance? and to make you sensitive to His will and His purpose and His plan, make you sensitive to uh, opportunities that come your way. In other words, do you begin the day sitting at the feet of Jesus? You say, well, I can't. Well, I 2,000 years ago. Mm -mm. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You have the Word of God lying before you. You can talk to the Lord Jesus Christ personally, and He listens to you personally. He'll meet every single need that you have. He'll give you guidance and direction. You have an opportunity with Him every day. Well, let's move on to some of these others because uh, they, they, they all apply to us in different ways. And I, th I think about uh, uh, this, looking at Luke, the fifth chapter for a moment, another incident that uh, is familiar, and I chose the familiar ones on purpose. Uh, one day, uh, Jesus was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and uh, teachers of the law, scribes, sitting there. He was in this house, and the house is full of people, jam full. And so the Scripture says that um, in the 18th verse, that some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and set him down before the Lord. Uh, but not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Now, here's, here's the issue. These guys knew their friend was a paralytic, could not walk, could not go anywhere. They loved him. They said, Jesus is close by, we're going to get you to Jesus because we hear he heals people from all kinds of disease and sickness, and he can raise them from the dead. We're going to get you there. So they get to the house. House is full. People standing outside probably, and so they couldn't get in. Now, the normal reaction would have been, well, 
I'm sorry we couldn't get you in. We tried. We, we thought we got here on time. The place is full. He's got all these important people, scribes and Pharisees and other folks in there. And so I guess we'll just take you back home. Really sorry. No, they saw this as an opportunity. Now, here's what I want you to see. Some opportunities will be difficult to deal with. Some opportunities will be hard. Some opportunities will be a challenge. Now, what you have to ask is this. If this is an opportunity, am I going to give up and quit just because it's difficult? Am I going to give up and quit because there seems to be a hindrance or a barrier here? And these fellows said, no, we're not. So what do they do? They climb up on the roof, and they start tearing the roof up. Now, they could have said, well, we couldn't possibly do that because Jesus would get so upset. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. And he's down there teaching all these important people. And surely, we're not going to break up, and we're not going to disturb him. They saw an opportunity for him to heal their friend, and they weren't quitting. They took advantage of an opportunity that looked like it couldn't work. And what I'm saying to you is again and again and again, and that's this. And that is, we're to be careful about the life that we live and how we walk it. We are to be wise about our decisions, and we are to be, listen, we are to be alert to opportunities that God just stares us right in the face. Most of the time, there's no warning. Most of the time, all of a sudden, you see there's an opportunity. For example, you go to work tomorrow morning, and somebody walks in and says, I've had the most difficult weekend of my entire life. Boing. Did your antennas go out? Are you alert to an opportunity right then for God to use you to do what? To encourage somebody. Opportunities are all around you. And one of the reasons that some people's life is so dull is because their eyes are closed. They walk around like this all the time and wondering why God isn't doing something fantastic in their life. Because they're not seeing the opportunities. We all have them. They're all around us. We can miss them if we are so wrapped up in ourselves, or we can miss an opportunity by excusing ourselves or defending some reason that we don't have. The man's life was changed. But those four men, th th their, life was changed, their life was changed likewise. So then I think about uh, uh, this whole opportunity uh, to witness. Think about this. The Apostle Paul, when he got to, to Athens, he knew about these philosophers meeting up there on Mars Hill and all the talk and so forth and the Acropolis and on and on and on. And he had seen these statues said to an unknown God. And they were up there with their philosophy about life and so forth. So Paul, he just, he just sees this as an opportunity. He could have said, well, now, they're not going to listen to me. They've got so many gods already. They've got one they can't even name. They don't know who he is. So they say to an unknown God. So why would I want to get in the middle of that? Paul just says, here's